Hello and welcome to my presentation on the post-quantum verification of Hoshisaki Okamoto. Let us first start with a few words about post-quantum secure encryption. Quantum computers will break existing public crypto systems and what we need to be sure, secure in the future are new crypto systems that are secure against quantum computers. This is not a new observation. Um, already for several years there has been the NIST competition um, which leads the search for the next generation public key encryption standard that is supposed to be post-quantum secure. And we have already reached the stage there that we have several promising candidates. Um, in the current third round we are left with um, classic McAleese, Crystals, Kaiba, Andrew and Sabre. And if we look at these crypto system, we see that they all have one thing in common. They use the random oracle to transform a weak, probably not um, cy chosen ciphertext secure encryption scheme into a strong crypto system in the random oracle model using something, some variant of the Fujisaki Okamoto transform. And this makes this Fujisaki Okamoto transform and all its different variants a very important transformation and we need to be really sure that the, this transformation is secure and is post-quantum secure. And one approach to be really sure is formal verification. So the standard approach when we are asking ourselves what is the security of a crypto system is to do a manual verification. So a human analyzes the crypto system, writes a security proof, and then other humans read this security proof. So these humans, the first human is probably someone publishing a paper and the other humans are the ones reading the paper. The problem with this approach is that it's very er error prone. It is very easy to introduce a mistake in a cryptographic proof, especially in the quantum case where a lot of non-intuitive things happen because quantum mechanics just do not match our human intuition. And it is also somewhat, um, the, the, the additional problem is that not only the person who writes the proof needs to be an expert, also the reader needs to be an expert and needs to be able to check each individual step of the proof to get full confidence in the result. On the other hand, we have formal verification. Here a human still writes the proof in many cases, at least when I'm talking about cryptography, but now it's the computer that reads the proof. And this has the big advantage that the experts do not need to check every step of the proof. The experts now need to verify that the specification, so the security definitions and their formalization, are correct. But the experts do not need to verify every single step anymore. So write once and it's done. So formal verification, if we can have it, is clearly a great advantage. So what do we have already in terms of existing um, infrastructures for this purpose? So there are actually already quite a number of tools of different popularity and maturity. Um, so probably the worst, uh, the most well-known is EasyCrypt. Um, there are also Crypt Hall, which is a similar approach inside Isabel Hall, FCF in Cork. CryptoVerif is um, a, a tool that does some automated or guided rewriting. Verupto, another formalization in Isabel. And I'm sure there are a lot of them that I haven't thought of at this point. And the approach that these follow is that of game-based proofs, which are probably known to most cryptographers from their own um, pen and paper work. So here we have several games, here symbolized by these program fragments. And from e one game to the next, we have a minimal difference in um, the behavior of the game. But the interesting question that does not arise that much in the pen and paper proof, but that becomes very relevant in the formal verification case, is how do we prove the relationship between two consecutive games? And here, the ways how the different tools operate so, so this point is where the different frameworks and approaches differ in subtle or in even uh, big ways. 
And in the case of, for example, the EasyCrypt tool, we have that EasyCrypt uses a logic called PIHL, probabilistic relational whole logic, which allows us to give us a ver give a very very fine grained um, analysis of the relationship of two programs and the games in the cr cryptographic settings are formulated as programs, and this is also a logic on which the quantum case will then later build on. The problem with all these existing approaches, however, is that they are not quantum sound. So all the soundness of these approaches is proven in the classical model. Um, adversaries are classical and so on. And a priori, there is no guarantee that anything that is proven with these tools has any impact on the quantum setting. In fact, in prior work, we have shown that in the for EasyCrypt, um, we could even give a, an explicit example of a multi um, a multi prover like situation where EasyCrypt would claim security, but there is no security in the quantum setting. So, what can we use in the quantum setting? Um, here, here comes. The, um, for this, we use our prior work on quantum relational whole logic. Quantum relational whole logic is a logic that is similar in spirit to the probabilistic relational whole logic from EasyCrypt, um, but it has support for quantum programs. So while PIHL in EasyCrypt has the same spirit, it can only reason about classical programs, classical adversaries, and so on. And even for post-quantum security, where the um, where the protocols are classical, we still need to read reason about quantum adversaries. So um, PIHL does not even work there, and therefore we need another logic. And QIHL is a candidate for that. There is also a theorem prover in QIHL called QIHL tool. Um, this theorem prover is designed for proving quantum crypto security proofs, but so far, that is before the current work, there have only been toy examples analyzed. So it was shown that, yes, you can express security properties and make security proofs, but it was only done for extremely simple um, examples. So what we will, what we embarked in on the present work is to apply that paradigm to a real-life complex security proof. So what is the security, um, the security proof that we analyzed and formalized? So we based our work on a result by Hövelmann, Skills, Schäger and Unruh from PKC 2020. And they showed the security of a key encapsulation mechanism using a variant of the fujisaki Okamoto transform. And um, one crucial aspect of this is that they, their proof also works in the case of decryption errors, which is very important when we are talking about lattice-based encryption, because lattice-based encryption usually has a negligible probability of failures when decrypting. And while this is practically irrelevant if this failure probability is very small, it does make a big difference in security proof sometimes. So even a negligible failure probability can break, can and did break some of the prior security proofs in the post-quantum setting. So how does this HKSU um, proof or the transformation analyze their work? So we start first with a um, in-CPA encryption scheme, and then we apply a sequence of transformation, first PONC, which drops just one element from the message space. And this gives us an encryption scheme that has a stronger security, so-called um, dis distinct simulatability, which means you cannot distinguish a valid ciphertext from an invalid ciphertext that is chosen in a way that has that is information theoretically distinct from any valid ciphertext. And then we want to make this um, deterministic while keeping the DS property. This is done in a totally standard way. We use a hash function to hash the message and gives, this gives us the randomness. 
And then the next step is to get a key, uh, a chem, a key, key encapsulation mechanism from this by um, simply de when decrypting or de-encapsulating, we re-encrypt the ciphertext with the ra um, randomness that we get when decrypting and check whether this randomness would actually lead to the ciphertext we had. And this trick has the effect that fake ciphertexts can be caught, and this is the core idea behind the, sec um, the in-CCA security of this chem. And then, of course, in a practical situation, you would use this chem combined with a um, symmetric encryption scheme in, a, um, in hybrid encryption, but this is not in the scope of this result. And this is actually also the simplest um, the simplest part of the whole um, scenario. So what is our contribution? First, we formalized the HKSU security proof. And this is, to our knowledge, the first non-trivial post-quantum security proof. And it is certainly not the most trivial candidate to take because it involves the quantum random oracle model. And while many post-quantum security proofs are essentially classical in the sense that they, are, they follow exactly the same steps as the classical proof, except you need to mention all the time the adversary is quantum polynomial time or something like this, um, but all the reasoning steps are the same. This is not true in the quantum random oracle model because you need to take into account that the adversary can make queries in superposition to the random oracle and this makes everything, makes even a classical protocol inherently quantum and this needs to be taken into account in the analysis. Our approach, besides showing that the fujisaki Okamoto transform is secure and giving the first formal verification of this also shows the viability of the QIHL approach. So before we only knew that it probably works for post-quantum crypto, but now we know that at least in this particular case it works. So it's a viable approach and we can look for the next protocol to analyze. We also, in the um, as part of our work, needed to extend the um, QHL framework uh, or the, the QHL tool. So we added support for the OTH theorem, the one way to hiding theorem, which is a very commonly used theorem for, um, for situations where in the random oracle model you have, you want to show that two games are indistinguishable as long that as a certain input to the random oracle cannot be guessed. And we added a tactic to the tool, so now it's, um, you can use the one-way-to-hiding theorem in security proofs in the QHL tool. And furthermore, we also discovered that the situation or the logic is not as easy as was thought. So um, while uh, so the ori originally the QHL tool had only support for global variables because you could just say when there's a local variable, just don't use it. Uh, I mean, when, there's, when you want a local variable used only in a game, you just make sure that no other game uses that local variable, uh, that global variable, which is supposed to be local. But it turns out that while this reasoning makes sense in the classical setting, in the quantum setting, there are all kinds of subtleties. So this led to an extension of the QHL tool where local variables are supported and also to an extension of the theory. Now, what does this QHL look like that I keep talking about? So in QHL, we have judgments. So judgments are just facts um, that allow us to compare, to state the relationship of two games. And in this case, here we see an example with um, two games, quantum game one and quantum game two, and a statement that if the quantum variables are the same before the execution, so this is this x equal y um, in the beginning of the equation, and we run game one or game two, then afterwards they are still the same. So if here x is a variable of quantum game one and y of quantum game two. So this would be a 
claim about the indistinguishability of those games. If they start with the same input, they end with the same input. Of course, we can have much more um, complex claims um, about the relationship, so it, can't, it doesn't have to be equality. Um, and the crucial point is that these pre- and post-conditions can actually talk about quantum states. But we can also talk about classical variables um, directly, which is very important in the um, setting of post-quantum crypto, where most of the variables we care about are classical, and just a few variables, like the adversary state or the query registers for the hash functions, are quantum. So now that we have seen what a QHL judgment looks like, I will show you a very tiny example of how um, a how the security proof actually looks like in the QHL tool. Of course, since the um, since our whole proof covers thousands of lines and um, dozens of files, I cannot really give you a true insight into all the proof steps. So I'm taking like just one um, part of the proof, um, a very simple one, and go through the steps there just to give you an impression. The proof that we will look at is the equivalence of two games, game 0FO and game 1FO, that are the first two games in the proof of the transformation U that goes from um, distinct simulatability to in CCA security. And you see these two games, they differ in a few lines. The most crucial step is that, um, that here the random oracle H is a uniformly randomly chosen function, while here H is a function that is computed from a few other auxiliary functions. The specific purpose is um, um, depends on the other pr proof steps, but basically H is not a uniformly random function, but depends on other functions in specific ways. And the second important difference is that here the adversary, so this is the adversary of that game, calls an, or uh, an oracle decaps query 0, while in the second game it calls decaps query 1. And we want to show that these two games are equivalent. So we have this lemma here. It says the probability that the bit B is 1 in game 0 is equal to the probability that it is 1 in game 1. And we show this with, a, um, with backwards reasoning. So in order to show this goal, we transform it into a different goal that's sufficient. So the first tactic says to show this, we need to show a QHL judgment. So this judgment says if this precondition is satisfied and we run game 0 or game 1, then this postcondition is satisfied. And this precondition, it basically says all the variables in the left and the right are the same. And this also says the bit B1 is the same in um, both games. So it's an equivalence. Then the next step is to inline the games, game 0 and game 1. And they're here shown on the right in the proof goal. And now we work our way backwards to this, to this proof. So the first step is to refine this post condition here, to replace it by another one um, that implies it. And we see here now, let me scroll it. We see here now that we require that all the variables are the same, except that the random oracle H on the right side is chosen in this specific way. And now we can start with the actual proof. So the first step is to get rid of the adversary call. And for this we have a, a tactic equal that says that we can remove a call without changing the two programs when it's almost the same except for some differences, in this case decaps query 0 and decaps query 1, and for these differences, we need to show that the two games still preserve the invariant. So here we have that uh, querying the G oracle preserves this invariant. Uh, it looks complicated, but it basically also says just everything is the same on both sides, except for the statement about 
the oracle, a random oracle H. So I'm not going into the detail how this is proven. Then we need to have the second sub goal is to show the same thing for queries to the function H. And finally, we need to show that the two decapsulation oracles, 0 and 1, behave equivalently. This is more non-trivial because they are not the same, um, but we can do this, um, we do this with a subproof that was in a different file, so I'm not going to, um, so it uses this lemma here that is shown somewhere else. I'm not going to go into that. And now we see that we have the two games again, but the last statement has been removed. So we need to show that now when we run the game up to this point and this up to this, this post condition is satisfied. It's the same post condition as before. And now we work our way through these games, step by step removing one line after the other. So now we remove these two lines in both games. They are the same, so it's an easy step. Um, remove another line, this K star line, now comes the C star that gets removed and it continues that way. Here things are a bit different. We need to remove the um, sampling of the random oracle, but it's not the same in both games. But fortunately our post condition here takes into account that this random oracle is defined in exactly this way. So we have some simple steps here. And now we have um, here the same code as here, basically, except here this undefined and here h, but it turns out to be uh, not used by this function. Um, so we continue in the same way, and I will not go through the details of this. And in the very end, so this is typical how these proofs go, we have no programs left, and we need to show that with this precondition, meaning everything is this, all the variables are the same, and we do nothing, then this post condition holds, meaning at least these few mentioned variables have to be the same. This is trivially, trivially true, so uh, because the, everything being the same implies a few things being the same, so we can do that. The last sub goal is gone, our proof is gone, and we have shown the lemma here that we started out with. And this we do for all the uh, pairs of games until we have shown the final security result. So what are the lessons that we learn from this formalization? Well, the good news is that to the largest part, the proof is basically the same as it would be for a classical protocol. So we talk about game rewriting steps where we change one classical computation and replace it by another classical computation. And the only way where it's quantum is that we drag along, along the invariant that the quantum variables of the adversary in one game and in the other game are indistinguishable. However, a few of the steps are like really quantum and need quantum reasoning. This is when we apply the one-way to hiding theorem. However, there the quantum nature is hidden from the user of QHL tool because it is inside the tactic. And then there are some situations where we need to do rewriting of quantum circuits. And even though it's quite simple rewriting of quantum circuits, um, just like uh, evaluating the composition of two classical functions and superposition, breaking this down into individual gates, um, explicitly reasoning about this turns out to be quite tedious. And this is the one point where we see that we do need some extra support for this and not have to have to do this um, by hand. What are some interesting points for future work? So we would like to verify the NIST candidates as they are. So currently we have analyzed a transformation that is like the transformations used for um, making NIST candidates secure. But what we re really want is to verify them exactly as they are specified, um, because there could be some subtleties, how things don't match up, etc., etc. So I, I think it's a valuable goal to analyze each of the finalists um, with the best known um, post-quantum security proof.
and specify exactly that final list. Then future work would include coming up with better ways to automate parts of this proof, especially the quantum parts. Um, this will make things more usable, faster to proof, um, the security of new schemes, etc. And of course, we would like to analyze post -qu um, fully quantum protocols, so not post-quantum crypto, but protocols where actually the um, honest participants are also sending quantum messages. I see no reason why this should be why there should be a problem, but it is an additional challenge that we have not yet tackled, and that is probably very interesting. So that's it for my talk. I thank you for I thank you for your attention. And um, as a last thing, if you're interested in this kind of um, work, feel free to have a look at the job offers in my group and. Uh, we are looking for anyone who does quantum crypto, who is interested in, in quantum logic, in theorem proving, and so on.